we have Candice Aldrick from um, the University of St. Andrews. We're very excited to learn more about the university. I'm going to share, I'm going to get her to uh, speak more about the university and then answer all your questions. But before I do that, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Namita Mehta, the president of the Red Pen. Uh, the Red Pen is an independent education consulting company that has been around for over nine years and we've been operating out of Mumbai, though we work with students all over the world. Um, besides helping students uh, navigate the undergraduate application process, we do work with students at the boarding school level, the postgrad level, and the MBA level as well. We have supported several um, high schools in India and globally set up their counseling departments as well. So yeah, we are a full-on education um, service provider. Um, my, my CEO and co-founder, Kim Dixit, is also on the call and she'll be supporting me this evening. Um, so yeah, before before um, we before I hand it over to Candice, just a couple of uh, housekeeping rules. There is a um, a Q and A box on your Zoom screen. If you have any questions, please post them in there, and we will get to it. Uh, we have already uh, some questions that some questions that we've um, sent Candice in advance, so we'll address those, and I will definitely get to yours as well. So, without wasting any more time, Candice, go ahead. You can share your screen and tell us more about St. Andrews. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead and get started. Uh, again, thank you for, for joining us today. I, I was glad to have the opportunity to, to present and talk about St. Andrews. As you may be able to tell, I am not Scottish. I'm from the US originally. Uh, so I apologize to anybody hoping to hear a Scottish accent. That was always one of the draws for me. Um, I, uh, I completed my undergraduate studies in the US at North Carolina State University. And then I came to the University of Edinburgh I'm not far from St. Andrews and completed my master's degree there before going back and working at Duke for a number of years. I've been in my current role for almost six years. Um, I'm quite biased towards Scotland. So as we as we get through the presentation and, and we open it up to questions, there's no silly questions. So I'm glad to talk about kilts. I'm glad to talk about student life in St. Andrews, whatever your questions are. Um, I've, I've got things set aside. Uh, I've got my slides set up to be very sort of concise and direct and try to address as many of the questions that, that you may have or that were raised. And again, I, I welcome the questions afterwards once I get through the slides. Um, as you may know, in terms of global map, where St. Andrews is in terms of, or where the UK is in terms of Europe, um, Edinburgh being very close, the, the airport's about 45 minutes from St. Andrews, and that's an international airport. So from there, you can get anywhere in the world. So it's quite well connected. When you factor in the, the public transportation culture of the UK, it's very easy to get around. Uh, so it's, it's, quite, um, it's, just, it's quite well connected. Coming from the US as a commuter culture where everyone drives, I didn't have a car for the first three years that I lived here when I took up this role and, and it didn't miss it. So it's quite easy to get around. Uh, and again, obviously uh, easy to connect, easy to get to India, easy to get to other countries. Um, the town itself is relatively small. It's about the size of most US campuses. It's only about two to three miles. Very walkable, very well connected. They have buses, they have taxis. There's also bicycle lanes. Um, and again, really you can get anywhere in town in about 15 minutes. Uh, the university is over 600 years old. As many of you may know, the town is over 900 years old. So they've really grown up together and the town, the university is mixed within the town. There's about 22,000 people and about 9,000 of those are the students. So we're just under half of the population. Uh, so it's, there's a very close, what we call town and gown relationship. Um, it also means that there's a life to the town that's not just for the university. So it's, it is this sort of uh, full package where you, you can have a, a full life there and, and not just always be about student life and university. Um, so we do have that town and gown community. There's also a, a very strong student community where for centuries the students have just been looking after each other. They have a, a tradition called academic families, which is effectively a buddy system where upperclassmen adopt the new students as they come in. Whether you're a PhD student, undergraduate, master's student, everybody kind of helps the new ones arrive. Um, and, so, and again, it's something that the students have just done on their own without the university organizing or managing for centuries. Um, so it's, when you factor all that in, it's very supportive. It's very safe. Uh, the part of the U.S. that I'm from originally is consistently rated one of the best places to raise a family um, in terms of safety and education and things like that. And it wasn't until I got to St. Andrews um, that I felt I could just let my son go outside and play. He was 10 when we moved to St. Andrews. And within six months, he was taking buses between towns by himself and things like that. So it's, it's a very sort of settled, uh, comfortable place in that sense as well. Um, it is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, being right on the water. We have three different beaches. Um, 
and it, obviously it is the North Sea. It's not tropical beaches, uh, but there is a beach life, there is a beach culture. Um, and it's, uh, as, again, it's, it's a stunning scenery that, that does not get old, I can tell you, after almost six years. It is the home of golf, but golf is not required, uh, so don't feel like um, there's an expectation everybody plays golf. Um, I have not yet played golf since I moved here. Um, but again, it's, it's, it is this very sort of, we call it the, the bubble, the St. Andrews bubble, because we've, we've got this, this small town that's incredibly cosmopolitan, people from all over the world, not just the students, but the professors, um, as well as people that are coming because of the historic uh, significance of the town itself, as well as the university. So it is this fantastic little combination of, 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 of just different factors that makes a really rich uh, community and environment to be in. Um, and it also translates the students, particularly that academic family tradition I talked about, translates to a very strong alumni network, which as coming from the US, I'm used to seeing from my universities. It's not something that's typically seen from European universities. Um, and so that, that sense of family, that sense of community really translates to a strong community for life that can help with networking, that can help with career opportunities, um, as well as personal. Um, again, roughly for our student body, about 39% are from outside of the UK. So that's quite a rich, diverse uh, student population. And so all of the, the, that's different influences, different reference points coming into the classroom. So you're able to really learn from each other. Um, that does also include the staff, uh, myself included as an example. Um, so it's, um, uh, it's being, being Scottish and being global is very much a part of the, the St. Andrews identity. Um, and there's, there's other sort of metrics and things that we also like to talk about. And, and some of that relates to the student experience that I'm describing. Um, you'll know about different ranking systems, particularly global ranking systems, QS and Times Higher and things like that. Um, some of the other metrics that uh, often aren't talked about are things like what I've got listed here, the continuation rate. That's the dropout rate. That's how many students continue after the first year. Um, there's also, there's obviously the employment rate after graduation. There's the graduation rate. Um, and so I, I've got it listed here and I've, I've got another slide that I'll have rankings to help touch on some of that as well. So it's, you kind of get a fuller picture. Rankings sometimes can be very research focused, particularly the international ones. So actually what they're ranking is how much research is being produced, how often that research is cited by other researchers. And so there's, it's, it's important to kind of have a full range of metrics that you use to actually assess what your experience and the value you will receive from the, the experience at a university. Um, so again, our continuation rate is 97% as is listed there. Our graduation rate is 96%. Our employment rate is also 96%. And I can touch on all of that as well. Um, and again, a lot of that signals, the, that, again, going back to referencing something like the academic families, the, the kind of support you get, not just from the university, but from your peers. Scotland does have a flexible degree system. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit more. It's different than the rest of the UK. So if you're interested in the UK, the education system in England, Wales, Manchester, places like that, is gonna be very different than Scotland. We're four years like it is in the US and you can change your major like you can in the US, your, your degree subject. So it's, Scotland is, is gonna be different. Um, and so it's important to know that if, as you look across the UK at different universities. Um, again, these are some of our, our um, league table rankings. Uh, you'll see, uh, first or second, uh, first in Scotland, second in the UK. Um, we're consistently one of the top students, uh, top universities in terms of student satisfaction, which is a national survey done every year. And then again, then you look at international, we're 100th. And again, some of that is based on the research output. Um, and so smaller universities are inherently going to be disadvantaged uh, just because they have less staff to produce research. Uh, so again, it's kind of when, you, when you're considering different rankings and different metrics, kind of look at behind, what's, what's behind that to, to get to the calculation and not just kind of go by the number itself. Um, we, we have a very, very active student life. Um, it's easy, it, it'd be fair to say our students work hard and play hard. Um, over 150 different societies or clubs, um, but also a very active student union or student government that, that lobbies and advocates strongly for the students. Um, and so there's, there's, a, there's a, a wealth of opportunity for people to get involved, whether it's planning events, whether it's representing the student body. Um, and so it's, uh, it's really worth uh, exploring that more because again, this also gets into the student life or the student experience for you. 
These are some more of our traditions that I was talking about, academic families, Raising Weekend and the Foam Fight relate to that. Um, and I can go into more about those, those traditions if you want me to. Um, but it's, it's, again, particularly coming from a, a US perspective that I have, it's a fantastic, uh, it's a, a fantastic experience to be part of something that's been going on for so long. And, and to have your place with that. And, uh, and again, it, it, it all also contributes to that overall sort of sense of community and, and bonding within the students. Um, again, career prospects, um, the 96%, the this is self-identified students, students who have come to us and reported that they've either gone on to grad school or um, are working within six months of their graduation. Um, and our career office is industry focused as opposed to subject focused. So you don't come in as an English major and immediately think journalism or something like that. You can come in as an English major, but maybe look at accounting, maybe look at consulting. Um, you know, as, as many of you will know and probably are told at your schools, it's as much about the degree subject that you study as it is about the soft skills, the transferable skills that you build up through internships, through your extracurricular activities. And so our career office is there to help you based on the career interests you have, not the degree that, or the subject that's on your diploma. Um, and again, the, the student, that student community feeling, that academic family tradition, the strong alumni network, we have shadowing programs and ways for you to explore career paths that may not be on your radar initially. So you can see people, say if, you, if you're doing English, see people who also graduated in English and the breadth of the, their career paths uh, and then connect with them and, and learn, uh, learn about their journey and see how that relates and if what's of interest to you. Um, even though we're not a big major city, we do have on-campus recruitment, um, and obviously the, the usual help with resumes, uh, video interviews, um, and we also hold networking events all over the world. So we do hold them in India, we'll also hold them in the US, we'll hold them in Singapore, and all of those are available to any of our students or any member of the St. Andrews community. Um, so it's, it's um, there's, there's quite a lot of opportunity, and the advice is usually to begin working with them as soon as you start. Don't wait until the third or fourth year of your four-year program. Begin from the beginning, before you even arrive on campus, you can begin to, to work with the career office. And we've got a, an add-on for LinkedIn that helps us um, keep all the alumni and, and, and keep a lot of those opportunities available for the students. This is a list of our tuition um, for this year. Um, some of these are still being set for 2021. Um, and beyond, um, but it kind of gives you an idea of the sort of the ballpark. Um, the, there's a range for accommodation um, because that may include meals, it may not include meals, it may include your own room or a shared room, things like that. There are a number of scholarships and various sort of bursaries and support packages available, um, including merit scholarships that are a full ride or full tuition at least. And so there's, there's a whole range. Um, it's worth exploring it on our website. Uh, and you'll see, uh, it's also important to see the, the deadlines for some of them. Um, most of them will open around October and then they can begin closing as early as January. Um, some of them are offered by the university, some of them are, are completely external and we just have them listed there because we know about them as a resource for the students. And so if you go on, you can kind of get an, even if you're thinking about a year or two from now, you can get an idea about what the timeline's like. Um, it's also important to know a lot of scholarships don't require you to have received your offer yet. And some of them may not require you to have applied to us yet for you to get the application into them. So you don't have to wait to get a decision back from us to apply for the off to, to apply for the scholarship, depending on which one it is. Um, so it's um, if you, it's, it's important to kind of scope it out ahead of time so you can kind of work out a timeline for yourself based on which scholarships you want to apply for and things like that. Um, generally speaking, if you're looking at U.S. schools, you may be looking at applying on the Common App. We are on the Common App along with a, a handful of other U.K. Uh, universities. So the, the typical deadline for the Common App is the 1st of May. This is all general information. There's obviously things are different for this current academic year because of uh, the pandemic. Uh, like Common App, for example, has pushed their deadline back to the 1st of June. Uh, so it's... Um, uh, so this is just the, the, the usual information. Um, if you are just looking at UK institutions or you're not looking at the US, you can obviously apply directly to us as the only UK institution. If you're looking at more than one UK institution, you can use UCAS, the UK uh, application system, and both of those have the same deadline. If you want to do medicine, that's going to be the 15th of October, regardless of which method or application system you use. 
Um, so when you apply, you obviously would pick that method for international students. And by international, I mean international for the tuition fees you pay, not international based on where you're living per necessarily. Um, when we assess your tuition category, we assess that based on your permanent residence. We assess that on a, a whole range of different information. So if you're assessed as an international student for tuition fees, it is a rolling admissions process. Um, and, but we can't have subjects that will get increasingly competitive as the cycle goes on. So it's, we usually advise try to get your application in as soon as possible. Um, and it, there is a, a range, we aim for about six week turnaround time uh, on most applications. Again, it can really depend on the time of year and the subject and things like that. Um, obviously, we'll look for, for your grades, testing, and, and that sort of thing, um, uh, as well as at least one reference. Um, most students will submit their, uh, if, if you're in high school, they'll submit their, their counselor reference. Um, if you're looking at graduate programs, um, usually we want at least two, with at least one being academic. One could be an employer reference or something like that. You have a personal statement, regardless of the level you're applying to, whether it's PhD or undergraduate, the personal statement carries a lot of weight for us um, because that is you, like, like applying for a job, that is a cover letter for your application on why we should consider you for that subject, that academic study of that program that you're applying to. So it's very, it's very important to stress the, your, your passion, your interest in the subject area. Um, you can talk about your, your professional goals, uh, but it, you also want to kind of approach it as the academic study of that subject. So it's not management because you want to go into business, you want to go into consulting. It's management because of the academic study of, of business management, nonprofit, government management, things like that. Um, so it's, it's important to have that, that sort of academic passion for the subject area you're applying to and, and then be able to sort of describe that and articulate that in the personal statement. That's what we're looking for. And when we have two similar applications in terms of academics, the personal statement is often what will be the deciding factor in who gets an offer and who doesn't. Because um, we have a personal statement that's targeted at another university or that just spends their whole time talking about how great the beaches in St. Andrews are, the one that talks about the subject and their, their, their interest and their passion in that subject area is what will be the one who gets the, the offer typically. Um, we do want to know about your extracurricular activities. Those are important. They tell us how you manage your time. They tell us your other interests, your, your other skill sets. Um, it's, it's important for it to not dominate or take up too much space in the personal statement. Sometimes students will ask their references to include their extracurricular activities. Um, obviously, if it directly relates, um, definitely include that. But we usually recommend trying to have three quarters, 75% of your personal statement be about the, uh, um, the subject area. I've got SAT and ACT listed there. Um, those are not required unless you're coming from the, a, a school with the U.S. curriculum. Um, but if, if you have taken them, you can include them. So if you're, if you're coming from India doing CBSC, ISC, but you've got an SAT or a couple of APs that you've taken because you're also looking at U.S. schools, go ahead and include it all. It's an extra metric. It's an extra data point for us to assess your academic, uh, your academic position and, and your likelihood to succeed if you came to St. Andrews. Um, again, if you're, if you're doing a, a different qualification, they're not typically required, but it does give us more information on your, on your academic abilities. Um, if you're coming from schools that do A-levels, there's a whole range depending on the subject. Um, some of our programs also allow for uh, skipping the first year, going into the second year entry. Most of those are the quantitative, they're the hard sciences and things like that. So there's a whole range of different academic or different A-level requirements if that's the curriculum you're studying. Um, and there, there may also be prerequisites, subject prerequisites, depending on that as well. Um, and there's, there's more information on our website that, that's broken it down by subject. If you're at a school doing IB, again, there's a whole range, including specific HL or SL um, requirements. Again, it really depends on the subject, the year of study, and things like that. Um, and then, um, you know, we, we've got, a, I've, I've mentioned there the, the different mathematic programs that depend again on, on which program you're applying to. So there'll be more details on the actual subject page that you're interested in. If you're from a, a school doing one of the Indian boards, uh, we typically look for 90% and above. Um, and then uh, as with A-levels and IB, um, there, there, there would be prerequisites. So say for example, you wanted to apply for biology coming from a school that does CBSC, we'd look for 90% overall average on your CBSC exam boards, as well as 90% in biology. 
Um, so sometimes what you may have to do is reference the IB or the A level qualifications to see what the prerequisites are and then cross-reference that with the, 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 the Indian board exams. Um, so the, that way you know what the prerequisites for your specific subject are, as well as the overall scores that we'll look for. Um, but again, more information is on our website, and then at any point you can contact me or contact my team to, to get more clarification if you need it. There are English language requirements. It's not, it's not automatic. Um, there are different ways to satisfy that requirement, whether it's a, a, a dual citizenship, whether it's uh, English CBSC score, IELTS test. Uh, so visit our website and see what the different options are um, and different ways you might be able to satisfy that requirement. Uh, if you do satisfy our, our requirement for the admissions pot process, that waives anything else you have to do in terms of the visa. Um, so the academic English language requirement is higher than what's required for the visa. So if you satisfy our requirement, that's going to automatically satisfy it for the visa. Um, but again, there's more details on our website. So that, that's pretty much the, the end of my, my slides. These are the questions. Namita, does, do you want to kind of take over from here? Or do you want me to go ahead and go through these questions first? And then... Sure. You know what? Let, um, I'm happy to take over um, just because there's lots of questions coming in from the chat as well. So... Okay. Do you want me to stop sharing? Is that the yeah, best just, way to sorry. Do? Yeah. Just give me a second. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Hi. Okay, so um, thank you so much, Candice. That was such a thorough presentation, and I think you covered so much that, um, you know, I'm going to actually skip straight to some of the questions that we have from the audience before I go back to the ones that we put up. I mean, you've answered many of them very well, so um, let's start with that. Um, so somebody's asking, um, is it possible to do an integrated master's with a joint honors program in four years? Typically, no, because of the, the required course time to go all the way to the integrated master's. So it's, it's hard to have a joint degree. So the joint degree option is really for an undergraduate program. So if you're on a, a track for a five-year master's program, it's not really an option to get a joint degree because you don't have two degrees at the end of it. But that being said, you will be able to explore other subjects in your first two years like any other student would. So say, for example, we have a, a master's in, in mathematics program. It's a five-year program. It's just that, that's set up to have one exit point. So you get one degree that, that master's of mathematics at the end of it. So you couldn't combine math with one of the other subjects, but you would be able to explore them, whether it's computer science, whether it's history, because math can be a, a, an applied math can be a humanities subject. So you would still be able to explore other subjects. There would also be an exit option out. So if in your first year you end up finding something that you're, say, sustainable development or something like that, you're much more passionate about that, you're not locked into that master's of mathematics route. You would have a way to opt out and change your subject. So you, you could apply into that, be admitted for it, and then get to the end of the second year and decide you want to change, change your direction. Um, so there, there's a lot of flexibility in that sense. But the, the, the straightforward answer to the question is no, in a five-year math master's route, there isn't a way to have a joint degree subject as well. Okay, thank you. And then the next question is, how many Indian students study at St. Andrews? I would say about 100, 125, if you add in um, all four years, including uh, grad students. Um, the numbers are increasing um, in a controlled way, because obviously, like I said before, we're a small town, so we're, we're not looking for uh, we're not looking for increases per se, but I would say there's probably about 100, 120 students on average across the different years. Um, right now, I'm looking at about probably about 50 to 60 students coming in this autumn. Um, okay. Mostly for masters and undergraduate. So there's there is a Sanskriti society, or which is our South Asian society. It's not just India, um, and it's it is a, it's one of our top five countries or nationalities in the student population. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, you, you, you really um, uh, beautifully articulated your career department and how they, um, you know, help students and how they're so industry focused. So what's the situation for, um, you know, international students who want to look for jobs after they graduate and finish their degree? 
um, you know, the UK has announced this possibility of, you know, staying on for two years. And I, I believe that's, um, you know, going to happen now for students that are going to be joining this fall. If you can speak a little bit more about that. Yeah. So the, the post-study work visa is for postgraduate students. Um, the, for undergraduate students, the, there is a grace period at the end of the, the visa, uh, the, at, the, the, at the end of the program where you can stay on and do say a three or four month internship. Um, and obviously if you're here in a four year undergraduate program, you've got summer breaks and things like that, that the student visa would allow you to work full time and, and accrue several different internship experiences. Uh, there is, I'm, I'm currently in the U.S. on a work employer sponsored visa, so that is an, a possibility. Like every country, there's, there's requirements for that, uh, but it is possible to have an employer sponsor you to stay on and work too. Um, so again, it just depends on, on the role and, and, and meeting the government criteria for that. Um, and again, the post-study work visa would be a two-year work visa that would come on and we, it would effectively extend your student visa and you'd be able to stay on and work for two years. Um, you know, there's, because of the pandemic, uh, there's, there's other, other routes that we know are being explored, nothing's being decided. Um, and so the, the career office is, is there, A, to help you navigate all of that, um, as well as help you navigate with employers who might want to hire you after you graduate, but don't know the, the UK government regulations themselves. So the career office is there to provide a lot of support. We also have an international visa team that will help you in terms of understanding what's required for your student visa, stay in compliance and things like that. Um, but it's, uh, we're very excited about the post-study work visa. So we're ready for it to come yeah. on. Um, and I think it'll be a, a really good opportunity. They had it when I came through to do my master's and then took it away. And so we're very glad to have it back. Um, but even as an undergraduate, it doesn't mean, because that, that the PSW is for post-grad, it doesn't mean there's not opportunities for undergrads too. Okay, um, and you know, in the U.S., um, typically you have to, um, you know, work in a work in a profession that you've done your undergraduate degree in. Does that apply in in, in the U.K. as well, or it doesn't matter? It's any job. So when you're when you're looking at the F1J1 requirements, um, there there isn't the same connection. Uh, so uh, you know, for the U.K., the regulations typically tend to be around salary level. Um, and there's different job categories um, for this is for employer sponsored visas. The post study work visa, there would be no connection. You know, with J1, F1, that CPT and OPT requirements, all of those have to connect back. And that wouldn't be so PSW would not necessarily have to relate. So you could come through and do a marketing master's program and then move on and do a, an, a, an accounting internship for a year or do a research project with your professor that's paid, for example. Um, so there's not going to be the same sort of requirements um, and also I don't I haven't seen anything uh, that's similar to the US system where you can only be unemployed for a certain period of time to say transitioning between internships there's nothing like that in the U UK so um, that, that post study work visa that's yours for two years you can be in the country so if you end up in a position where you've got one intern internship and you don't get something that immediately follows the line up after that you're still able to stay in the country. You don't have this time clock that starts. Um, so there, there's going to be differences uh, compared to the, the, the U.S. system with that as well. So that's that, it's a great, it's a good advantage to students, I think. Yeah. Um, I noticed that on one of your slides, you mentioned that the deadline for application is 30th June. Um, so that's different from the other British universities or are I mean, the students, somebody's asking well, that question. Yeah, I think they, they, they can be, to, there's some, you know, with the, with the U.K. system through UCAS, Usually it's 15th of Ju January, which is the deadline. That's for UK nationals. Yes. Okay. Uh, this, this is for internationals. Students. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's the difference so you can for that. Continue applying till June. If you're again based on your fee category when you apply. So okay. if, if you're a dual citizen and you have residency in the UK, you might be assessed as a UK student for your okay. tuition. And then the 15th of January deadlines there. So what I was listing was just for the tuition, the international tuition category students. Okay. So on the same um, uh, topic of application, there's another great question. I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask you to answer in any way. Um, you know, you if can I apply through UCAS to five other British you know, British universities and then apply to you directly as a sixth or not? Typically, no. Um, the, 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 the preference or the advice is if you're applying, if you're using UCAS, all of your UK institutions are, are on UCAS and that limits you to five. Um, there, there's, a, there's a gray area with the Common App 
um, because obviously the Common App doesn't limit how many universities you apply to. And so usually our advice is use the Common App if all of the UK universities that you want to apply to are on the Common App. If you have one UK university that's not on the Common App, then all of the UK universities need to be on UCAS. And then at that point, there's a limit of five. Um, so again, it really kind of depends on what, what each individual student's looking at. Um, but there, there's not a way to kind of get around the system and do a six application using the direct route. Um, we, we try to kind of balance and respect what's set up for UK through UCAS and also understand there's this Common App option if people are looking at US schools too. Okay. Um, okay, so there's a bunch of questions coming through about psychology. Someone yeah. is saying, can you please tell me more about, you know, the details of the psychology program, how many students per class, and do I need math at higher level to apply for psychology? So, uh, to get to math, no, you do not need math. Um, as, as it's not listed as a prerequisite. The psychology is a subject for us that can be either a humanities or a science subject, which means you can take psychology with history and film studies, or you can take psychology with computer science and biology. Um, and I, I mentioned that about the maths because we will look at maths and we will look at your sciences because if you apply as a BSc psychology student, you may want to take those subjects and they have those requirements. So we're gonna, we'll take that into account while it's not listed as a requirement for psychology. We're going to take it into account because you may want to add something later that would require it. Um, so it's it's your offer would never be based on math because we don't have it listed. Um, but obviously, depending on whether you pick that humanities track or that science track, uh, will kind of depend on what subjects we look at because we, we do take this very holistic approach. And I, I didn't stress that in the application enough. And. Uh, so it, it is, we're going to look at everything and we'll understand if you're applying for a science subject, your sciences and humanities are going to be perhaps more relevant than your English might be. And conversely, if you're applying for humanities, the sciences won't be as relevant. So again, it's all, it's all contextual in that sense. Um, help me with the other parts of your questions. The, the number of students in the class is that each cohort, actual each like lecture. I think it says how many students per class. I guess you can answer for both. I mean, maybe how many yeah. taken for psychology and then the number of students yeah. in the. In the um, it's hard to answer how much are, are actually in the cohort because of the way students can add. And so we might admit 150 students for psychology, but your lecture might have, or there may be 300 people wanting to take psychology in the first year because they're adding it as one of their other subjects. Um, and you would never have a lecture that's 300 people. So that, that's why I say the class size is different. So you might have you might have a lecture that has say if we admit 100 people, all 100 people in that lecture, and then you will spin off into these tutorials or small groups or discussions or labs that only have maybe 10 people in them. Um, so the actual class size in terms of actual classroom depends on again whether it's a lecture, whether it's the small group, and it will also get smaller as you go up in the years. So your lecture in your first year may have 100 people in it. But your lecture in your third year may only have 20 people in it. Um, you know, again, because so much happens in those first few years with people picking up and exploring other subjects. And then when you make your final decision at the end of your second year, your third and fourth year look very different. Because at that point, it's just the people who want to focus on psychology in, in this example. Um, so it's, you know, the, the class sizes do start out a little bit larger in the first few years, and then they get progressively smaller and more, more intimate with the academics. Um, but, but again, we, we don't admit that many students to begin with. They're relatively small compared to other universities. Like I said, it's a small town or a small university. So I would say probably we probably admit about 150 students. Um, and then but the, again, that doesn't tell you anything about the actual classroom size because of the way other people can pick stuff up. And then the first part of the question, what can I tell you about the program? Um, Psychology is, is obviously also with neuroscience. I work very closely with several of our, our psychology professors on both sides because um, it's, it's, it's a fascinating subject because it can be very applied. It can be very sort of behavioral. Um, you think psychology, the typical sort of um, uh, counselor type. And then you can have the, the more sort of pure the science side where it's, it's, it's a bit more getting into the neuroscience, how the brain actually works. And so, you know, the, the two really work closely together. And so you will have a behavioral psychologist working with a neuroscientist to kind of 
merge their research. And there's a lot of, it's very, it's a very research, all of our programs are very research focused, but psychology in particular from the undergraduate level and up really brings the students in. So you, will, you can be a third year student getting journal articles published. So it's, you're working very closely with the professors. You have access to, to lab space, individual lab space, um, and so it's, uh, there's a lot they do to support the students. And anybody that's interested, um, I, can, I can show you my details and help connect you with those academics that I'm working with on both sides, the sort of harder neuroscience side and the more sort of applied psychology behavioral side. Because um, uh, there's a lot of really great, fascinating work. And we have a lot of different um, research centers within the psychology and neuroscience department um, that, again, range from behavioral all the way over to sort of more harder neuroscience side. Um, there's a lot of everything from um, children, behavior in children, to uh, research on uh, nerve synapses in maggots. <laughs> so it's all, there's a whole kind of, there's all sorts of things they do and it's absolutely fascinating. Sometimes it's worth actually connecting with some of the professors to just get them to talk about their research because um, they're, 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 their passion for it's also quite infectious. Um, and I'm, I'm always glad to help people connect directly. And the professors welcome that. They're, they're very happy to be contacted, even just cold. They don't have to, you don't have to be introduced. If you find somebody on our website, by all means, just message them directly. Um, but it's, uh, psychology in particular is quite a fascinating uh, department and they're doing a lot of really great work, both within the community as well as sort of larger research. Okay, Candice, and before we ask, before I ask the next question, I think um, one of the attendees has requested you to maybe speak slightly slower because the voice is echoing a little bit. Sorry about okay, that. Right, I, right. And I, I, you know, I, I just checked with Kim and she said it is a little wavy. So, the, I mean, I can hear you well, so I'm not sure maybe just okay. the internet issues, but okay. Um, okay. So on the same, um, you know, subject topic, I mean, I, I do want to actually ask you a little bit more about, you know, picking majors and minors, but I'll do that next. Um, there's a question about, you know, studying economics and um, if there's, if math is a prerequisite. Um, I noticed in your presentation that you said that you do accept if you're an IB student, either of the math uh, programs um, are, are fine for uh, St. Andrews University, but um, is mathematics at a at higher level a prerequisite for an economics um, intended major? Uh, technically, no. Um, it's not, obviously, economics and finance are put together, so math is going to be important to finance. Um, so kind of like with psychology, economics is another one that can be either humanities or sciences. So like with psychology, it is something we're going to look at, but uh, an offer would not be made conditional on a math higher level in an IB situation. So we, we will look at math just like we will look at a lot of different other subject areas. Um, but it's, it's not a listed prerequisite if that helps so you're all, an offer would never be based on that but obviously economics and finance being what they are math is going to be important to them okay um okay so i'm gonna um talk i'm on i want to know a little bit more about you know how you the flexibility you have um, in choosing the major and the minor or like swapping classes because you did mention that when we apply in the personal statement, you really have to speak about your subject area, like 75% of it has to be dedicated on, you know, why you want to study that particular subject at university, why you're passionate about it. Um, I mean, in, in the US, the system is set up such that, you know, you, you can totally, you go 180 degrees, have an intention to study economics, and then go get a history of art degree or something like that. Um, you've, you know, touched upon this, but if you can just speak a little bit more in detail about how, um, you know, how much flexibility there is. I mean, if I intend to say study economics, can I just move into engineering or can I not? Um, are the, you know, the, the combination subjects, is there a limit or can I literally carve my own um, major? Um, I would just love some more insight on that. Yeah, so the, if you think about sort of university system as a spectrum, you've got the, I would say probably most of the world, the three-year model, you have a subject that you start with, there's very little flexibility and you can pretty much stay with that subject the whole time, very focused, very concentrated. And then you've got the, the US system that's on the other end of the spectrum where you don't have to have a subject to start with, you can be undeclared. And regardless of what your interest is, you have to take a little bit of everything. When I went through and did mine at North Carolina State University, I was a international relations and chemistry major when I started. So I, I started out with a subject, I didn't start out undeclared. And I, so I was deliberately starting out crossing humanities or combining sciences and, and humanities together. Because of that liberal arts general education requirements approach that most U.S. universities take, um, 
you will take everything and that's why you can make the changes from one side all the way to the other in terms of sciences and humanities because you've had to have built up a certain number of credits in everything anyways. So the Scottish model sits in between that. The Scottish model is going to be four years like the U.S. system. Um, you like the the three year model. You would come in with a subject to start, but you can take other things and and change your change your major, change your degree subject. It's it's harder in the Scottish system to cross between sciences and humanities because you're not building up the foundation in those subject areas. So if you come in and say a history major, you're not going to be required to take organic chemistry and statistics and things like that. You're able to just focus on history and related subjects. So it's harder for you to suddenly do a, a 180 over to a biology because you've not taken anything in it. Um, it doesn't mean you can't take the odd science course as a humanities student. It really depends on timetabling and, and things like that. So especially in the first couple of years, the way you can pick up other things. It doesn't mean you couldn't take it, and, and the system does allow for a certain number of your degree credits to come from the other side, from what you start with. Um, but it's because you're not, because we, because we don't have those general education requirements like in the U.S. system, you haven't built up a foundation, so there's, there isn't the same sort of crossover uh, like you can get in the U.S. So with, but within, there's, at least in terms of St. Andrews, there's over 900 different subject combinations because of all the different subject areas that you can make. And so there, there is there is a breadth of flexibility in those first few years. And the Scottish system works really well for people who have a general idea for what they want to do. Maybe it's biology or chemistry, but they're not sure they like both. Um, or they know exactly what they want to do and they want to be able to customize without having to take a bunch of other stuff. So they, they know they want psychology with computer science, something like that. Um, so it, it's, it, it, again, it all boils down to what the goal is for each student and which system is going to work better for them. I can see how, you know, for me, the U.S. system was the best because I was wanting to cross sciences with humanities. Um, and I can also see how the three-year system works really well. It's only three years versus school, but it's one year less of tuition. And you can be much more focused and done sooner. Um, so I think at the end of the day, it boils down to what the goal is, um, what you're trying to achieve by going to university. That's the undergraduate system. Obviously, postgraduate and PhD is going to be different. Um, but that's going to be the big difference between the U.S. four years and the Scottish four years, is that that crossover and the, the, the foundation you lay in the different subject areas. Okay, so that 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 that, that I think answers the question. Um, I actually want to ask you a, a couple of direct questions. One is, what is the most competitive major to apply into, and what is the most common major? It depends on the cohort we're talking about. Generally speaking. Um, it's international relations, closely followed by computer science and physics. Um, so obviously that's science the, and humanities. Yeah, and that, that's, that's, that's pretty much across the board. Yes. Okay. Uh, most competitive is in most popular, most people going for them. So that kind of ratchets up um, the, you know, you, like, like, like a lot of universities, we have the minimums that are posted on our website and we have the actual offer point that we, the, the, or the academic point that we make offers. You know, so and a lot of that's also contextual to the, the fee category that you come in under. Um, so it's uh, meaning it, it can be the the actual score that we make offers on may be higher if you're a, a Scottish student versus an Indian student, as an example, because um, it, it all depends. Some of the there, there's government regulations that impact our offer making too. So it's actually really quite complicated, but. Um, uh, generally speaking, across all of them, it's international relations, computer science, and physics. So those can be the hardest to get into. And then um, uh, the most popular include those three, um, as well as things like English, particularly comparative literature. Um, psychology is very, very popular and increasingly becoming one of those more top competitive subjects, particularly for people coming from India. Um, sustainable development is another really big, um, and obviously economics, management. So again, it also kind of really depends. Um, if you ask me just for people from India, I would say uh, most competitive is still going to be international relations. Most, most popular is probably management followed by economics, um, followed by psychology, um, and then sustainable development and international relations are sort of top five. Um, so it really depends on, on where the student's coming from too. Okay, so another very specific question on psychology. 
um, if a student is interested in psychology, should they, one second, should they apply directly for that or do a liberal arts and then major in psychology? Also, if you apply directly for psychology, can you change over to another major like sustainability? Yes, you can change. Um, the, you, you, have to, you have to start with a subject that you don't apply into sort of a liberal arts general system and then decide. So you have to pick something to start with in the Scottish system. So if you were to apply to us, you could apply directly into psychology in your first two years, take sustainable development, take history, take computer science based on what you're, whether you pick that science track or the, the humanities. Um, and then the, the caveat selecting your final degree subject that you do at the end of the second year, the caveat is that any, you have to have taken it all four semesters of the first two years. So to get to this question, if the person say they applied to the science psychology, BSc psychology, they add sustainable development, and then they also take a computer science course. Get to the end of the first year, they're not enjoying psychology as much as they thought they would, but they really like the sustainable development and computer science combination. So in their second year, they keep sustainable development, they keep computer science, and they add a management course. So at the end of the second year, it's sustainable development and computer science, they've had all four semesters, and they can decide then to do a joint if the, if the two subjects are compatible in terms of timetabling. Or just do a single, um, you know. So you, there's you're not locked into what you start with. You're not locked into a single subject. You can change and do a joint. Um, so there is that level of flexibility. Um, and you may also, again, really like the combination of psychology and sustainable development in this example. So there's the possibility of starting with psychology and then changing to a joint with something else. Um, so it's it's there is that level of flexibility. And again, it. it uh, the only difference with that U.S. model is you're not picking up a bunch of extra stuff around it. So you wouldn't come in as a psychology student and again also have to have a certain number of classes in physical education and a certain number of classes in gender studies and things like that. So you're able to just focus on your picking everything you take and that's all you take. Um, so there, there would be uh, that level of flexibility. Um, if you can give me just a moment, I need to plug in my laptop. Okay, that's me back. Okay, super. Um, so I want a question on fee structure, on, on like your, what fee category you fit into. I'm a British citizen, but I live in India. What fee category would I fall into? Uh, likely international. It really depends on how long you've been in India, where your permanent residence is, where your parents own property and pay taxes and things like that. Okay. Um, usually what happens, the way, the, the, way the, the, the process works, you apply based on your application we will assess your fee category or determine we need more information. Sometimes in situations like this question, we may decide I don't have enough information. Our fees team will decide they don't have enough information and they will send you a questionnaire that allows you to detail out, again, property, taxes, passports, permanent residence, and things like that. Um, it's a fairly, I want to say it's something like a 10 page questionnaire. So they'll send that to you to get that information to be able to make a more informed decision about what your fee category is. Um, generally speaking, if you've got this dual citizenship, but you spent your whole life in, in India and that's your, your family's permanent home, you'd be considered international. So it really just depends on the situation for each person. Okay, thank you. I think that's pretty clear. Okay, I'm gonna move on to a couple of questions about medicine right now. I um, mean, you know, I put it up on the screen as well that, you know, obviously, you know, me, uh, medicine is a very popular degree in, in the UK because you can study it directly at the undergraduate level, unlike other places. Um, what, you know, which exam do you guys look at, the BMAT or the UCAT, and what is the interview like? We, we take the UCAT um, and the interview process, and there's a an acronym for it, or there's an abbreviation, but it's a multi- MMI, the mini yes. medical interview. So you do that? Um, and Yep, that's what we do, um, and okay. we will do them virtually. So you, if you're not in the UK, you, you're not expected to fly in just for those interviews. They will do them for you virtually. In some cases, they travel to the country, so it just depends. Um, so we will look at the UCAT, and we, we do expect you to have taken it before you apply, so you're actually going to take it the year before, or that, that, that sort of uh, late summer, early autumn before you apply, um, so that you've got the, the test. Um, and we, we don't have a the, the range or... or the, the test score that we usually look for changes each year based on the overall average of that test globally. So if you go on our website, you can see what the, the average test score we made offers to was for this current year. And that'll give you an idea of what 
you might need for the next year. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, the actual test score for the UCAT will change slightly based on what the overall average was for it. Um, but, but there's usually not much fluctuation with that anyways. Um, but it, it is, there, there is effectively that, that's two step process where there's going to be your application. And if you pass that first step, then you move on to the interview. Um, and the interview typically is not academically focused. It's more about bedside manner. It's more about what you understand the implications of a career in medicine are. Um, so they, you know, they're not going to be asking about anatomy. They're going to be asking again about you know, delivering bad news to families and things like that. Um, yeah. And so it's a, you see the, the first step is the academic step and it is quite high. It's very, very competitive. We only, we only admit 100 students globally, including Scotland and the UK. Um, so it's, uh, and, the, and there are government regulations that control how we divide up those 100 as well. It's very, very competitive. And so it, it's not a reflection on the student. Um, the success of their application isn't, or their academic ability, it's, it's, it's very difficult. But if you do pass that first step, and you move on to the interviews, and those are usually done after January. So after the, the application process is closed, they'll, they'll, they'll make a decision on that first step, and then if you're invited to interview, usually this sort of January, February, after that kind of winter break period. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move on to a few, um, you know, COVID related questions now because they've also been popping up. Um, I mean, I guess given the current situation, you know, applicants, parents, students, everybody's a bit anxious because, you know, they, everyone's been doing online classes, exams haven't happened. Um, given the current situation, are you going to be evaluating students differently for fall 2021 or is it just going to be the same process? We, we, have a, we have a standing mitigating circumstances policy that's part of our admissions policy. It's published on our website. So that allows us a lot. We already take a contextual sort of holistic approach anyways. But that means we can take this sort of like, like the global pandemic into account. We know there's going to be implica implications on testing. Uh, we know that there could be dips in grades because you were suddenly not getting instruction for several months and things like that. So that is the sort of thing. Um, that we are able to do, we, we give ourselves that level of flexibility. Um, because we are contextual, you know, we, we'll assess each application independently. And if, if, the, if the school's already made an adjustment on grading because of the pandemic, we want to kind of balance that because that, that's already been taken into account by how they've graded. And so it's, it, it's contextual for each student, for each situation. Um, you know, other students may also have additional factors on top of pandemic impact and so it's um just kind of assess it individually each application is usually touched by at least three different people um so that we get different eyes on it and uh, so that we, i wouldn't say what we look for in terms of what i listed on my side that's not going to be any different but obviously we're going to know there's been this pandemic that's affected everybody and just kind of factor that in as we assess everything probably for the next two if not next three years you know because if you start looking at sort of u.s students doing U.S. qualification, they may start taking APs as soon as they're, you know, after their, their ninth, ninth grade year, kind of depending on the person. Um, so there's, there's going to be a longer term impact from this, and we know that. Um, so we will factor that into how we assess things, yeah. Okay. And, um, I mean, you know, the million dollar question, I guess, that everybody wants to know, will you be opening for, uh, for classes in the fall? Um, or have you not decided yet? And or is it going to move online? Is there any indication yet from uh, St. Andrews what yeah, they're going to be doing? Yeah, no, we, we made the decision about a month ago. Uh, we, we are starting on time. We have a dual, dual delivery option so that we have the flexibility. Um, you, know, you know, obviously we have to, we will be following government and health advisory regulations or, or, or recommendations, but uh, we are planning to start on time. We are planning to start in person as well as have this dual delivery option. We may be on time, but you know, India might be closed. Malaysia might be closed as so the students can't leave. Uh, so we have this dual option, this dual delivery option, so they can start online. And then as soon as they're able, come to us, whether it's a month later, whether it's the next semester. Um, so we, our, our, our goal and our aim is to have everybody in St. Andrews, as would have been the original plan. Um, and so we've got the online option there. We're not moving our programs to being online. We're just having online delivery, dual delivery, to accommodate what each person needs until they're able to be with us in town or on campus. Um, but we are planning to start on time one way or another. Um, 
mm -hmm. uh, according to the schedule. Classes are scheduled to begin on the 14th of September. That's good news. Um, I'm just going to move on to a question about safety. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that um, you know, St. Andrews is in a very safe town. And I mean, you know, that, you know, having your 10 year old go, uh, go in the bus on his own is obviously an indication of how safe it must be. But, you know, given the pandemic situation and, you know, students who weren't able to fly back to their home countries who are stuck on campus, you know, what kind of measures has St. Andrews taken, taken to take care of them? And uh, if you can just talk a little bit about safety in general, because obviously parents are sending their kids so far away and this is of course a big concern. Absolutely, absolutely. And I guess in my mind, the support as a result of the pandemic is a little bit different than safety per se. The, the support that we've given, we have about 900 students who were not able to, to leave, 900 international students who were not able to get home. Wow, that's a as lot. Everything locked down, yeah, as everything locked down um, in March, or sort of late February, earlier March. Um, and we kept the, the dormitories or the halls open. We kept staff there to feed them and look after them. Um, all of our halls, for example, include um, cleaning twice a week. So all of that, you know, so as much as possible, we're supporting them as well as helping them navigate the whole social distancing requirements and things like that too. Um, we, we work closely with the, the Indian embassies um, in the UK government offices too, um, as there have been, as, as different countries have arranged flights for their, their, their citizens and things like that. Um, our student service department is also continually engaging with them just to help them cope. You know, we have counselors on staff in our student service department, so they're there to help the students emotionally, psychologically, um, and do everything that we can just to help them and manage personally, you know, day to day getting through it. Um, and so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very personal, it's very direct, um, you know, and I, I personally am in touch with four or five of my Indian students who got stuck um, in, in kind of helping them. And again, uh, some of them have been going to student services for the, that kind of sort of uh, personal or, or emotional, psychological support. Um, and we, we're all keeping tabs on on things opening up and on different government initiatives to help people get home so that we can make sure they know about those as soon as possible too. Um, you know, I, I know for a fact the, the Indian Embassy in Edinburgh has been reaching out to a lot of the students and the, the universities that are kind of closer to, to them like we are. Um, so I think it, it's about, like, like everything about this pandemic, it's making sure everybody's not alone. There is a lot of, everybody's doing everything and we're all here to try to help each other get through it. Um, and, and I guess so, so that's, that does kind of connect in with the safety question because it is, for San Andrews, it is very much about the community and the student experience and, and the individual student experience. And so what we're doing to support those students who are stuck here who could not get home is reflected in the, what makes the town safe and what makes the university life and the town community experience what it is. Um, and it, it's something that I, my father was an academic. I've grown up on university campuses. I've worked and attended several on my own. And it's been that sense of community. And, and every university will say we have a great student, student community, great student life, but it's, it's been the way to pay it forward. And some of you may have seen that movie, Pay It Forward. But it is this very just sort of proactive, taking that extra step to help look after each other. And, and that's reflected in the way we looked after these students who are who are stuck. I know the principal's been in direct contact with those students, so it's it is very personal, individual, and that's what makes it safe as well. Because you do get to know people. You see your professors in the grocery store, and you've got the little old ladies who talk to you as you're walking down the street, and you'll see people you know within a couple of weeks of starting your program. You'll start to know people, and you'll see them and pass them in the streets, and so you do feel like you're in this. Um, you know, you're in this community. It, it, it may be very similar to what people might experience for. A, you know, boarding schools or something like that, if any of the people attending have those kind of experiences, where you do just know each other and you look after each other in that sense. Um, and, and it is quite safe and it is quite settled. And I've had, particularly from India, I've had a lot of parents whose children had never left India. Um, the parents may have never left India. Um, and this was the first time, and they all came up together. And within a few hours, they could tell how settled their, their son felt, an example that I'm thinking of. Um, and so it's, uh, and again, I think some of that's just the way everybody looks after each other. I mean, you know, like anywhere else, you know, we are an open campus, we are an open community, you know, people can come from anywhere. So it's not like things can or couldn't happen. 
but I think it's the way everybody looks after each other that, that really makes the difference. Uh, and it's, it's been a large part of how we've responded to the pandemic situation. Okay, thank you. I think, you know, unfortunately we're running out of time. Candice, thank you so much. I'm just going to end by asking you one question. Um, you know, what advice would you offer to international applicants in this current situation? Um, perspective or current, anyone, um, just a piece of advice that we can end with? Connect with others. Um, you know, obviously if you're a current student, um, that's going to be really important to help you as you're navigating through this. But if you're a prospective student looking at different communities, different university lives that you might want to join, it's going to be connecting with the other students and getting their experiences. So whether it's going on, on our website, for example, and looking at the societies and the clubs, um, we do have a feature on our website where you can connect with, we have a team of student ambassadors, and so you can just connect with them directly. Um, so I think my best advice would be to talk to other students, talk to other people, um, and sort of piece together your own picture about what student life would be like based on everybody's experiences, because you'll, you'll get commonalities and you'll start to get um, the sort of joined up student experiences um, and help you get a good picture about what it's actually like to be on the day-to-day you know, -to -day on the ground. Thank you, Candy. So I think that brings us to the end of our webinar. Um, thank you, all the attendees, for joining us. I have left, um, you know, Candice's email addresses here. So if any of your questions weren't answered, please feel free to email her. And thank you for your time. Have a, have a good day. That's great. Thank you.